chapter twenty four of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain foreigners in paris paris besides the parisians contains a population of foreigners which form no insignificant feature in the physiognomy of the capital although almost entirely confined to one quartier of the city the hotels as we have seen of the rue rivoli and place vendome the whole of the hotels of the quartier des tuileries are almost exclusively frequented by foreigners but it is not of these that we would speak but of those who have made paris their home of these the majority of course are english that class of restless english who having acquired a little money now aspire to what they cannot attain in the strongly defined circles of their native country consideration distinction and fashion now a thousand a year in london implies for a family if not poverty at least privation calculation and economy but by crossing the channel this thousand a year becomes twenty-five thousand francs and there is as great a difference between what can be obtained in paris for that sum as there is in the sound of the two sums pronounced in english or in french your english families of this class abound into the by-streets and upper stories of the quartier rivoli they cannot divest themselves of the vulgar english idea that consideration is attached to place and circumstance true in order to come within their means they are obliged to be on cinquième or on sixième but still they can put rue de rivoli or rue des pyramides or rue castiglione on their cards and that is so much better than being comfortable in any other rue unknown to english ears your english family some small city merchant or pensioned government clerk or retired lawyer brings his family over to paris mrs blank and her two beautiful daughters were not going to live in a villa at clapham or kilburn pulling caps for clerks and clergymen the only men they ever saw and these only visible on sundays oh no when there was paris where they might see dukes and counts and go to court and who knows perhaps to the english embassy and might marry there is no knowing who long ringlets plump figures blue eyes and dazzling complexions are rare in france so poor dear mr blank who had been looking forward all the days of his life to a garden a pony chaise and long mornings dawdle over the times and a twaddling shilling whilst in the evening with sims and scroggins is scolded and seduced into transferring himself to paris here behold him dumbfounded helpless turned into a mere porte-monnaie forced to cling to one of his daughters who in the purest anglo-saxon french drives all the bargains of which the only clause confided to him is pay papa papa is the most interesting hero of the family if misfortune inspire interest for he is decidedly the victim of course he cannot speak french nor will he try for somehow he has a vague idea that it would be infringing on the liberty of a free-born englishman and unconstitutional to speak a foreign tongue he cannot bear going up so many stairs to get home and you cannot get it out of his head that the upper story of a house is an attic he will not think floors however polished half so comfortable as the commonest kitty minster carpets and persists in thinking the french an immoral people because they stare at the outrageous manners and extravagantly fashionable dresses of his daughters still he is forced to be content mrs Blank is an admirable manager they pay one thousand francs a year for their apartment they have furnished it in the parisian style and if mr Blank remonstrates at some piece of useless luxury mrs Blank exclaims but think of the saving in the mirrors be it known that every unfurnished apartment in paris is always decoré de glace mirrors are considered as indigenous to the walls they have two servants a cook and a femme de chambre to each of these they give four hundred francs a year with two bottles of wine apiece per week and mrs r Blank, says they do the work of five english servants and do it pleasantly too as if they liked it in fact the whole affair is so cheap that mrs r Blank, really thinks she will be able to save enough money to send tom to college at least this is the grand panacea applied to mr r Blank, whenever he sighs for sims scroggins england and his club meantime whilst the home arrangements have been diligently carried on by mamma the exterior diplomacy is no less diligently pursued by the young ladies society society that is their great aim they have letters of introduction to several leading families in the english circle on these they rely for the realization of their chimera 
they first however visit the milliners and the dressmakers and order something stylish something frenchy as they say something anglais something ridicule according to the milliner and the dressmaker but of course as they are paid and have given up the idea of inspiring taste to the english they implicitly obey the orders be flounced be crinolent our two young ladies proceed to pay the momentous visits on which so much depends taking the tuileries in their way where if their object was to be stared at that object is attained for every eye and eye glass follows them in their meandering course along the grande allee mrs a blank and lady b blank the two great leaders of this class of society the one a widow of an east india merchant the other the widow of an alderman but a little richer than the r blanks having no children and who by dint of having outstayed every one else in paris they have been there some twenty years have risen to be lady patronesses of all newcomers now they look upon all letters of introduction brought to them as so many tickets to dinners and suppers which they are to receive in return for their patronage no one was ever known to have had even a glass of eau sucre in their houses they receive their friends in other people's houses and return invitations by invitations to the houses of those they are called on to patronize so they make the r blanks give a ball and to mrs r and the girls intense satisfaction their rooms are crowded to suffocation there were lots of young men with mustachios some with red ribbons in their buttonholes besides two countesses and one russian princess who really never went out but who to oblige mrs r blank has consented to come on condition of a carriage being sent to fetch and take her back and a neat little supper prepared for her before the rest in r blank's cupboard of a dressing-room his clothes having been thrust into a sideboard whilst he dressed in the ante-room his bedroom being converted into a card-room this russian princess has done much service as the great gun in english i and american society in paris for many years she is very rich so says report and very miserly at least so again says that well-informed personage a report but she is full of whims and manias and never receives though she lives in a large hotel in a fashionable street but the dignified concierge as he takes your card invariably informs you madame la princesse ne reçoit pas the princess was so fortunate as not to have been recalled in the recent flight of the russians from paris the czar somehow overlooked her name on his list of absentees as for the two other noble ladies papa if he plays whist with them will find out what they are but they will not play whist with him for some time they can make more by another game these ladies do receive receive all the dissipated and hard-up men in paris but they find it difficult to get ladies therefore are they always on the alert for fresh importations from the two lands of innocence and english whose daughters are allowed to wander out without the chaperonage of their mothers now the two miss r blanks will figure as deux riches anglaises at madame la comtesse's next réunion an announcement which will bring round them numbers of adorers all titled and well dressed putting the girls brains if not their hearts into a flutter of vanity and delight these adorers will follow the r blank girls from party to party in the circle of acquaintances which will have grown out of the grand ball given by the r blanks flirtations will ensue carried on under a mask of mutual deception and ending in mutual disappointment for both parties are too wary to marry without mutual explanations so from flirtation to flirtation from party to party these girls drag through their youth ending generally by marrying in desperation some young english clerk over on a holiday for a few weeks who knowing no better is smitten by what he thinks french graces and so they go back to islington or clapham ill-tempered old women discontented wives and totally unfitted for any of the duties of life mrs r blank meantime finds that the necessaries of life being so cheap her family and herself have so launched forth in the luxuries that it is even harder to make both ends meet than it was in england after all it is papa who at last is the most contented he has in the world in which his daughters live found two or three old cronies with whom he can rail against the french and talk politics he reads all the english papers at galignani's then spends his time by searching after good sherry port brown stout and english medicines expending the little french he has acquired in trying to persuade the french butchers to cut up their meat à l'anglais as he calls it for he disdains genders and to serve him a decent joint 
this class of foreigners by far the most numerous in paris are the people who bring paris society into disrepute and spread at home the noise of its immorality whilst in reality they have never seen any french people at all or only such as respectable french people never do see there is another class of english besides the diplomatic circle consisting of younger branches of great families authors artists and people whose large families exceed their means these are to be found in the streets adjoining the champs elysees in the faubourg st honore these families have access to the very highest society both french and english they do not seek to disguise that they are not rich and decline most of the invitations tendered to them the real motive of their residence in paris is that their children may enjoy advantages of education which could not be attained in england besides for intellectual social people of refinement intercourse with the intellectual and refined is a necessity to descend in the scale of social life is impossible solitude would be preferable to frequent their own circles in england with moderate means would be impossible without subjecting them to mortifications which would wound their self-respect therefore do these families come to paris here fortune is but a secondary consideration in the metropolis of hearts and ideas its absence excludes from nothing but ostentation artists literary men diplomatists the elite of the faubourg st germain the ambassadors themselves are all friends of this class of english where the amenity of manners the high-bred tone the sparkle of wit and intelligence repose from the glitter and tiresome routine of the world the theatres all the museums of art all the academies of sciences are visited by these sensible specimens of foreigners in paris once or twice in the course of the year they go to the embassy where they are treated with the greatest distinction the only class they do not see is the class we have described your mrs r blanks would give their ears to enter their little salons but as they cannot they stare at them at the ambassador's chapel every sunday quiz their bonnets and vote them old fogies it may not be uninteresting to give an aperçu of the prices of the various masters for which the english take their children to paris an admirable music master can be had for five francs a lesson a vocal teacher of great ability for the same price provided a name is not to be paid for when as much as twenty-five francs is charged for instance garcia bordoni la blache are all at the latter price and rubini and rossini when they could be induced to give singing lessons charged as much as sixty francs a lesson lessons in foreign languages are on an average paid three francs drawing at the same rate as for dancing that varies but it is not expensive it must be remembered that all these lessons are private lessons and that the professors come for that price to the houses of the pupils next in number to the english are the poles and now the hungarians these two nations with few exceptions are like the greeks better when wedded to immortal verse than when seen in all the prose of everyday life the poles at least those who leave their country have an irresistible tendency towards the chevalier d'industrie they are ever in search of some extraordinary coup de fortune or of some extraordinary person who shall suddenly give them the means of really being what they strive to appear an honest industry is beneath their dignity the polish and hungarian refugees are the heroes of the cockney english balls whence they hope to extract a rich wife some the rich wife failing are content to take a poor one who can give a home and a daily dinner thereby considerably increasing the managing contrivances of the mrs r blanks so lucky as to get such a son-in-law there is however a most bright and particular exception to this rule in the person of a distinguished nobleman on whom the hopes of his countrymen for some time rested prince adam zartoreski who for many years has now been domiciliated in france he holds a species of polish court and lives in almost royal style in an old palace in the ancient part of paris called the hotel lambert eugene sue has described this magnificent specimen of architecture and decoration in a novel of his which bears that name prince adam and his family are remnants of a past age chivalrous noble above the world and its strifes resigned to their exile awaiting other times with patience and dignity the princess is known for her charities 
which make no distinction of creed or nation but which however are especially dedicated to the relief of her countrymen prince czar Tariski has a very large income at his command and therefore has much within his power he has however shown his judgment by refusing to listen to any offers however tempting even though they offered him the crown of poland the hour is not yet come another distinguished pole is m louis valeski who to begin confesses unlike most of his countrymen that he is not noble by birth but nature made him noble by endowing him with her best gifts and giving him strength and courage with them to work his way to fortune he is one of the professors at the institution des arts et métiers italians too we have in paris refugees of course but to their honour be it spoken neither idlers nor swindlers italians are ready to do anything for a living from chorus singing to shoe-blacking and shaving and they will confess the calling to which circumstances have reduced them without the slightest shame ending with a shrug and a smile that makes one smile also instead of pitying the italian aristocracy had for some time its representative in one of the most accomplished men of his day the prince emilio bel handsome a profound scholar well versed in all the modern languages the best shot the best swordsman known an accomplished musician with a voice like mario's only with more power and vigour he with an independence worthy of respect and admiration when first he escaped from the austrians into france went as an assistant professor in grisier's saloon but there he was soon discovered by the young nobility of france who had often been his guest in milan and he was not suffered to pursue his self-sacrifice shortly after his fortune was partly restored to him and for years he was the ornament of french society now he has chosen another lot he has abandoned the world and on the beautiful lake of como his life is spent in the cultivation of the arts with one who has left a position as high as his own the world mankind's her own esteem for his love the princess belle blank his wife from whom he was separated a year after his marriage had for some time a salon in paris but she was bitten by a political mania and repaired to lombardy to make a revolution having failed in leading the troops on to victory she has now taken to eastern habits a long pipe and corresponding with the new york tribune now we come to very delicate ground on which we will not presume to tread heavily but merely to skim lightly over we allude to americans in paris as a class compared to other foreigners they are not numerous the americans generally appear to prefer italy to paris but the few who are in paris usually rich specimens of upper tendom come there resolved to make as much noise as possible they outshine and outherod your english by a good deal the men invariably get into the very worst society to be obtained for money in paris they dress ridiculously always do things no one else would do and at hours when no one else would do them but where there are plenty of lookers-on whether to blame or to approve matters not notoriety appears to be their passion here as well as at home a fast young american such as those who come to paris persists in confounding all french women into two classes lorettes and grisettes that is as far as virtue and morality are concerned this generally ensures his being turned out of the first respectable house he gets into and so throws him amongst the very class he has been seeking with whom he of course affiches himself the american ladies however have more tact and sense though even they delight in outraging the customs of the country in which they reside it must be confessed however that the americans are in far better society than the english generally there is no rule of exclusion as by english etiquette and then people are not exacting we beg your mercy about americans they have no standard whereby to judge them so to europeans they are all alike and the french people tired of english snobbery are inclined to pet the originalite américaine that half civilized country of which by the by they know as much as they do of the mountains and the moon americans have admirable opportunities therefore of going into the best society both french and english but in general those who are rich do not choose to be admitted into society but insist on being themselves leaders of fashion an attempt which ends in disappointment and exclusion and brings some who have been leaders here back in disgust 
and make others remain and spend their money for the satisfaction of feeding hungry poles italians hungarians black-leg englishmen or fourth-rate frenchmen and obtaining the title of le restaurateur américain end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the influence of women in france in no country has the great topic of the day the great question which has agitated philanthropists the rights of women been so little discussed or so little spoken of as in france the women of all classes appear to be perfectly satisfied with their lot with their position with the rights that both the laws and society concede to them from the very earliest times of her history the influence of women has been felt in france and the salic law was perhaps instituted not from any conviction of the inferiority or incapacity of the sex but as a measure of safety to prevent men from losing even the very semblance of power in ancient rome it has been said all the great revolutions were caused by women but in france it must be remarked that women have achieved not destruction and disorder but glory and reform according to the period in which they lived and its necessities if france has preserved its nationality if it is still amongst the nations of the earth it is owing to the influence of women when the successful arms of england had conquered france and aided by the tyranny and oppression of the various factions which divided it had established everywhere its power two women arose from the ranks of her own people one beautiful tender loving and devoted agnes sorel who roused the desponding energies of charles the seventh and sent him from her side to claim his kingdom and his crown the other jeanne d'arc a humble peasant girl whose imaginative mind evoked a vision from her dreams and led her to fight and conquer by the side of her sovereign restoring to france its name and existence as we proceed in the history of france we find women either ruling openly under the title of regent or counselling under the title of wives or mistresses the name of every monarch of france is connected with some female influence by whose name often the events of a reign are recalled we are not historians and will not therefore trace the power of women through various ages but coming down to more modern times will stop at the great mind which overshadows and directs the giant movement of the french revolution we refer to madame de stal whose intellectual endowments were not surpassed by any of the great spirits which the chaos throes of that period brought so numerously to the surface at seventeen she wrote a remarkable financial work having shared her father's cares and studies when he had the direction of the finances in france there can be no doubt but that the crisis of the revolution prepared by the writings of rousseau voltaire and the encyclopedistes was materially aided by the pen of necker's daughter unlike the works of women her political writings were distinguished for their plain common sense their close reasoning and their adherence to facts madame roland another woman who influenced one party of the revolution the girondin wrote eloquently admirably but having had no scope for her imagination and her enthusiasm in the days of her girlhood when love usually calls these two faculties into life she expended both on her political writings her influence therefore was not lasting and only affected a few within her own immediate circle yet did that influence sway the most gifted the noblest of this party beginning with her husband himself who though he might listen to the opinions of all never took counsel but from his wife to come still nearer to our own time the popular storm which drove louis philippe from his throne is to be attributed to the press which fanned ever by its burning pages the fire of liberty and revolt ever existing in the bosoms of the french people in those days the pamphlets the articles which ever passed from hand to hand which were read in public meetings which were so dreaded by the one party and hailed by the other as the signal which pointed the way forward were traced all by the hand of a woman a woman it is true who had disguised herself under the name of a man but a woman still george sand her pen too wrote the proclamations and speeches which for a short time drew the attention of europe on le dru rollin had she had power of action as well of counsel and words she would have spared the cause much ridicule and censure even though she had not achieved its ultimate purpose french women have a great natural talent for politics 
almost all politicians meet in the salon of some woman whose rank and intellect entitle her to discuss the great events of the day which after all will some few years afterwards be taught as matters of history to her grandchildren the princess levin the widow of a russian prince who was for many years ambassador to the court of st james but who is a naturalized parisian has ruled and still rules most of the cabinets of europe so much for the political influence of women in france an influence of course confined to few and to the upper classes of society but in all ranks women in france have more power than in any other country and this is mainly attributable to the sphere of usefulness in which the manners and customs of the french have placed her in the middle classes the wife has the entire management of the domestic arrangements not in the sense understood by domestic arrangements in this country actually doing the work of a domestic but ordering superintending and administering all the home expenses french women learn arithmetic and the true value of money it is a portion of their education so that they can have no self-deceptions as to what a restricted sum will purchase order is one great quality of french women though they have much of the imaginative faculty they do not apply it to the most inexorable of things money and never gratify an extravagant caprice under the impression that chance or their husbands may find the means of paying for it a french woman possesses the entire confidence of her husband with regard to his income and his means of making it therefore she can have no illusions then extravagance of dress would not increase the esteem of those around her but rather diminish it therefore there are no temptations to overstep the boundaries of prudence french women go very little out into the streets the husbands return home to dinner which takes place between five and six in every class dinner is the grand event of her day the husband knows it too and the thought of the welcome which awaits him quickens his step as he leaves the tedious office or counting-house where perhaps a wearying occupation or an ill-tempered superior has exhausted and worn his spirit as he goes along he thinks over his vexations and wonders what ma femme will say about it all and he feels how she will sympathize with him how advise him eagerly he crosses his threshold the familiar smile and the nod of the portress who has seen him come in at the same hour for the last ten years first make him feel that he is somebody then he mounts the stairs and his wife who has watched his arrival from the window taking her station at the very hour and minute he turned the corner of the street is standing at the entrance door ready to receive him as he enters the ante-room a savoury smell proceeding from the kitchen tells that there too he was waited for madame as she passes along calls out servez jeannette voilà monsieur dinner jeannette here's your master to which said jeannette replies popping her good-natured face and her white cap out of her domain tout de suite madame et tout chaud pour réchauffer monsieur it's all ready ma'am nice and warm i only waited for master here too he was expected his spirits begin to rise spite of adverse circumstances and dissatisfied employers he feels that there is a place in the world where he is of as great importance as those who have made him feel he was a nobody and he proceeds through the dining-room glancing at the brightly white tablecloth on the cosy round table with its clean napkins its bottle of bordeaux and its pile of bread all tokens of welcome he enters his wife's room the salon is for great occasions and there all is neatness and even elegance for madame's room is furnished like a parlour with the exception of the well-curtained bed in an alcove the wearied husband heaves a sigh of relief as he looks around him and sinks into his own comfortable armchair. the wife sees that there is something wrong but she does not begin to tease him by questions to add to his annoyance she has a woman's and what is more a french woman's tact so she is not likely to commit any such blunders at dinner she is more attentive than usual to his wants he is more silent she talks to him tells him the occurrences of the day whom she has seen what she has read the news of the day all in fact to lure him into cheerfulness she knows that though she may have had annoyances and perhaps felt a little dull and solitary he has had cares and toils she does not expect him to come home prepared to listen to petty grievances or to amuse her listlessness she feels for him not for herself and prepares to soothe away this temporary cloud when they have dined 
when they have taken the tiny cups of mocha with which dinner concludes when they are again in the cosy room where jeannette has let down the curtains and made a bright fire there is a moment's silence the husband has recourse to the invariable french habit which wood fires have created and which to express it has a verb of its own untranslatable in any other way but by explanation the verb is tissonner and the thing consists in taking the tongs which in france are very ugly and ill-made but small and light and playing with the pieces of wood which continually detach themselves from the logs and piling them up again an amusement which though incomprehensible appears to have the soothing effect of smoking on the temper and spirits after a few moments the wife placing her hand on her husband's shoulder will gently say to him cas tu mon ami then the floodgates will be opened and all the grievances of the day told in all their detail but told in that quiet happy room with the loving eyes gazing on him even as he tells them they appear less and before he has finished speaking he begins almost to wonder how such trifles could have affected him then she sympathizes so thoroughly but never irritates she dwells on words of an equivocal meaning and shows them all in the brightest light then he smiles and he thinks he was a fool and with one or two decided thumps on the logs puts down his tongs and leaning back in his chair begins to talk cheerfully sometimes the wife who is as we have said the administrator of the household expenses will draw from her secretaire some hidden saving ten or fifteen francs and in order to entirely dissipate the dark atmosphere will laughingly propose to treat her husband to one of his favourite theatres in an instant her bonnet and cloak are adjusted the neatest of gloves buttoned and they are gone each capable of enjoying to the full the genius both of authors and actors and each enjoying both more because they are enjoying them together woman's influence thus gently felt the influence of every hour is one which never decays and which ensures the happiness and purity of the home circles it is an influence never asserted therefore never disputed and the husband himself scarcely knows to what extent it exists there is another source of woman's influence too in a class distinct from the one we have just described that is employment mutual employment of both husband and wife to their mutual interest and in the interest of their children in the various trades of paris there are very few excepting those exclusively devoted to men such as tailors saddlers and so forth where the wife and husband are not together in the shop and counting-house from morning till night they have their home above their shop and they repair together leaving the shop in the care of the première demoiselle to take their meals with their children enjoying this family meeting as a moment's respite from the daily toils and talking of their future plans or the amusements which next sunday is to bring forth now the husband has no need of a confidential friend to whom to confide his perplexities or embarrassments his wife knows all his liabilities all his resources she will advise with him devising the best means to meet them or with the ready wit and quickness of a woman find some resource or expedient which she has never thought of then he has no anxiety as to his cash for his wife is cashier and makes up the books all fear of being cheated or robbed is therefore removed from his mind their interests are mutual so he can attend to the outside trade the buying and selling in the wholesale market in perfect security that no one is taking advantage of his absence madame however though she is a woman of business does not forget that she is a woman and does her best to be an attractive one both in her dress and in her manners in this class a dereliction from virtue is almost unheard of the change in society which has taken away the pomp of circumstance from the nobility and reformed its morals has taken away the only danger to which this class of women was exposed the seduction of a marchande by one of her own class has perhaps never occurred and were it to happen the justice of society would fall as severely on the man as on the woman a marchande therefore desires to please universally all that come into her shop she is amiable cheerful agreeable polite and graceful to all making no distinction of sex though perhaps taking a little more pains to please the women than the men because it is a more difficult task flirtation intrigue or passion never enters her well-regulated head she has no time for them she has no moments in which she feels that life is a burden that her husband is not so elegant as monsieur blank 
that she is an unfortunate woman misplaced on earth understood by none she never sets her grief to desponding rhymes for she has her double entries to make she has very little time too to give to literature in general but after the shop is closed and her children have said their prayers kneeling at her feet she just reads a page or two of the feuilleton which her careful husband cuts out of the papers and pins together for her especial use she is fond of music too but then it is only of a certain kind and we are afraid to say it is not of the best and certainly not of the most scientific kind her idea of music consists in those wonderful little tunes introduced into the french vaudevilles at the most critical and exciting moments these words and all she catches up with the most extraordinary rapidity and caroling them about in the most joyous manner with a tiny little canary bird voice to the delight of her children and her husband the former loving the air and the latter the little epigram at the end of each verse in her dress she follows the grace of the fashion but not the material her merino dress will be of exquisite fineness her collar and undersleeves of immaculate whiteness charming will be the covering of lace and ribbons she wears on her small head beneath its softening shade are displayed the thick glossy bandeau of her jet-black hair and even if she could possess no claims to beauty there is such a refinement and a grace about her that even by the side of her most elegant and fashionable customers she attracts and charms her good temper is unceasing her vivacity untiring her health always good nerves she has none to torment either herself or her husband she thinks attaques de nerfs are the privileges of riches and idleness generally in this class the women are superior to the men a fact of which they are fully aware but of which they sedulously refrain from making their husbands aware though of course unconsciously they feel its effects in all around them and in the happiness they enjoy the great object of the wives of this class is to keep their husbands from the cafes and billiard saloons into which the necessary intercourse with men in commercial life would lead them for this they are ever on the alert to provide some inducement to remain at home a french woman does not give up the art of pleasing her husband the instant the honeymoon is over she on the contrary begins to try her power after marriage for before marriage she has been allowed scarcely any opportunity the influence of such a woman is felt by all she is the life and spirit of the house and when we think how large a class of the population of paris is included in the commercial class we must acknowledge that woman has a most extended power over a very important part of the population of the capital in the highest ranks women are surrounded not only with the usual courtesy and deference due to the sex but are looked up to with a degree of poetical worship it is the boast of this new world that a woman can travel from one end of the country to the other without being insulted but in france not only is she certain of not being insulted but she is sure of meeting with every aid and attention she may require and this though she is aged and has no attractions as surely as though she were young and beautiful women to this day in france are surrounded with the halo of chivalric days the appearance of a woman always produces some effect no man ever passes a woman on a staircase without raising his hat to her and on the footpath way is deferentially made for her dinners and assemblies exclusively of men are very rare things in france compared with other countries and to the presence of women may be attributed the almost total absence of intemperance in the better classes of society where it would be regarded as a crime whilst for the same reason it is rarely seen amongst the people as a mother the very customs of france have established an extraordinary power by decreeing that mother and daughter should be ever together and the most beautiful examples are daily seen of the tender friendship which binds them together through their lives women are too protected by the laws their property is settled on themselves enjoyed and administered by themselves and returns to their own families should they die without children a woman never abandons her own name though of course she bears that of her husband yet in all important or legal documents she signs her maiden name adding her married one to young girls is left influence in the home circle though debarred from the liberty of choosing their associates going into public or on to the streets there is no restraint put upon girls at home there they are the pets of the father of the brothers cheerful unaffected and good-tempered because free from the bickerings of vanity they are the life and poetry of home 
paris has been called the paradise of women and though of course it is but an earthly paradise and not exempt from woe and sorrow still should any disembodied female spirit be condemned to resume her earthly career and revisit the glimpses of the moon we cannot but think she would choose the moon which gleams on the gilded dome of the invalides the spires of the tuileries and the turrets of notre dame End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain parisian society and parisian celebrities of all subjects connected with paris the subject of this chapter is one upon which foreigners know the least and about which the grossest errors have been promulgated and believed in describing as we have done the various classes which in paris have a distinct physiognomy from the same classes in all other capitals in enumerating the various forms of refinement which even vice and error take in france it must not be supposed that we have been describing what is called society neither the lorette nor the grisette nor the students nor with rare exceptions dramatic artists are admitted into what is called society unlike every other country each of these classes has a distinct circle of its own in which it perpetually revolves a circle recruited from its own ranks and not aspiring to any other one of the distinctive characteristics of the french is indeed a certain dignity which precludes that degrading craving for richer and higher acquaintances so universal elsewhere the outward forms of french society are full of etiquette and ceremonial almost to coldness french manners are the quietest in europe loud talking loud laughing anything that draws the attention of the many on an individual is in the very worst taste and sedulously avoided by parisians both men and women so that what people call french manners meaning noisy boisterous conduct such as to attract the eyes of a whole circle or a whole theatre on one person are by the french people quietly set down as either english or american under the bourbons the return of many of the old noblesse from immigration or from their country seats whither they had retired during the napoleon era brought back the manners of the old court or ancien regime as it was now called whatever fault may have been found with the morals and the political institutions preceding seventeen ninety three it would be impossible in any way to criticise the manners of that epoch refinement and politeness could go no further however much france may have been reformed and altered since that period it must be admitted that the manners altered as they are have degenerated to the reign of louis philippe may this alteration be traced and to the great fusion which has taken place between the french and foreign nations from the pipes of the germans came the habit of smoking modified by the polite frenchman into the less obnoxious cigar from the english they borrowed their mania for the turf calling it le spa and imagining themselves english because they imported english grooms and horses and tried to imitate the brusquerie of english manners the accession of louis philippe brought into high places a class which had been long struggling for the outward emblems of the power they already possessed having in their grasp wealth which ruled the world this class brought ostentation in its train vanity haughtiness and pretension an eager desire to outshine every one an assumed contempt for the advantages of birth and position and an insatiate desire to be received and recognized by those they pretended to despise to speak plainly the reign of louis philippe put vulgarity into a court dress still it was french vulgarity and in a very short time it learnt how to wear the folds of its drapery with grace still the inauguration of the finance or la chaussée d'antin changed the simplicity of french society the chaussee d'antin gave great suppers grand dinners had quantities of servants whole hotels instead of apartments walked upon velvet ate off gold so that au sucre old-fashioned furniture well waxed floors and two servants who had lived all their lives in the family but were anything but stylish dared no longer to call itself society and the very first elements of society wit genius and good breeding were forced into obscurity and overshadowed by the more seeming and by what is valuable only when it enhances intellect 
but this golden rule had but a short reign it expired from very weariness and was of itself forced having the shadow to seek the substance first artists were coaxed into the circle though artists are an independent set disclaiming patronage meeting as they do encouragement and appreciation from the government the church and the highest aristocracy they are entirely exempt from toadyism still they came led perhaps by curiosity and retained by flattery and praise the coin that wins the artist sooner even than the coin of the realm then came alliances between the quarterings of the noble faubourg and the money chests of the chaussee d'antin an exchange which softened the rude angles dividing the two classes gradually making them dissimulate their riches and the noble subdue his pride louis philippe too when he found himself firmly on his throne began to weed his court and gradually society recovered its tone having by the slight social chaos through which it had passed destroyed many of the partition walls of prejudice society in paris now in its present state has accomplished a fusion without which society is merely party spirit tending rather to establish bitterness of feeling than social intercourse still it has established it with certain restrictions which are more inexorable in paris than in any other country in the world parisian society cares not for riches though it does not refuse to admire and enjoy an occasional display but it envies it not and habitually dislikes it parisian society cares not for birth it cares not for fine dresses though it requires a strict adherence to cleanliness and forms but is perfectly indifferent as to price or quality of material when we say that in no country is a strict adherence to the proprieties of life and to its moralities so exacted as in france we shall probably meet with many incredulous readers yet such is the fact it is not french as common tradition has it for wives and husbands to go different ways on the contrary whatever may be their way of living at home society exacts that when coming into its circles they should come together whether to theatres balls or parties society too in paris exercises a control over the conduct of young men these liaisons that we read of these extraordinary derelictions from the right path may be very well for a newspaper paragraph and the paris correspondent may make much of them showing off his own wit but giving as false an idea of the capital from which he dates as the french editor of a popular paper did of new york when he gravely spoke of the sombre quaker population of that exceedingly fast city we do not mean to advance that the morals of la jeune france are purer than those of la jeune anywhere else but we advance and maintain that they pay homage to virtue by keeping their dissipations from the public being fond of the society of women and respecting their mothers and sisters they sedulously conceal all female associations which might call a blush on their cheek all illegal alliances all gallantries are more or less known but they are never talked of neither are the adventures of dancers and courtesans ever openly alluded to nor their names ever mentioned in society that is in the presence of men and women fulfilling the duties of their station and living according to the laws of god and man some disposed to cavil with all that is french merely because it is french may call this hypocrisy and think it adds to immorality but we might as well cavil with a couple who quarrel only at home because they did not also quarrel in public and accuse them of misleading society as to the way in which they agreed with regard to the conduct of women society in paris has established rules which in some measure limit the power of scandal and certainly act as a restraining principle in the absence of a higher on women in general as far as regards unmarried women we have already explained that there is but one rule that they should be always under the safeguard of their mothers observing a reserve of manner which the little influence they exercise in society of course inspires now with a married woman the rules are quite as well defined as long as a wife lives under her husband's roof as long as his presence with her in public sanctions and protects her the world may whisper the world is notoriously fond of whispering everywhere its opinions and observations but it has no right to openly manifest its disapprobation or its suspicions but if once a woman forfeits the protection of her husband if she is separated from him and his home is no longer hers then the animadversion of the world has free scope to exercise its malice or its censure so strict and invariable is this rule that when a young woman is separated from her husband without any fault being imputed to her 
she gives up society even though she may have again sought the asylum of the paternal roof she is no more seen excepting at rare intervals in numerous assemblies or at balls or even too frequently at theatres or public promenades the only independent position for a woman in france is that of a widow and without wishing to accuse the gentler sex of any magic way of getting rid of their husbands it is strange to say that there appear to be more widows and young widows in france than in any other country the young widow in france enjoys every privilege she is the only woman who may flirt dance come go and dress exactly as she pleases she is the great resource of the french dramatists all the heroines of french comedies and vaudevilles are jeunes veuves because that is the only condition of woman which allows of the very necessary ingredient in a french comedy of ostensible love-making ending of course in a usual fifth act catastrophe a second marriage the great feature of parisian society is its simplicity and sociability invitations are of course given for any great festivities such as dinners balls and concerts but there is scarcely a house in paris beginning from the upper classes down to the lower grades which has not its own small circle of friends meeting uninvited excepting by general invitation every evening throughout the year at these meetings there is no dress or ceremony no obligation to stay a long or a short time the only obligation is to bring a good temper good manners intelligence and as much wit as nature has bestowed on you if ever social life or sociable parties really existed it is in these reunions where each contributes to the entertainment of the whole where no extraneous resource is admitted where neither the want of music nor dancing is felt and yet where the hours pass cheerfully and profitably along french women are not what is called accomplished therefore there is no terrible sonata to be thrown off no excruciating bravura to be endured and the french as a nation are not a dancing people now whatever they may have been there is not one quarter as much dancing in paris as there is in london and not one-third as much as there is in the principal cities of the united states there are balls for about six weeks in the year and occasionally in the summer a bal champetre at a village fete but as a general thing the frequenters of these reunions would as soon think of proposing a horse-race as a dance though in the english society in paris no sooner do six people get together than for want of ideas and conversation the young people take to giggling and polking although the young men of france may not be as good classic scholars as the senior wranglers of oxford and cambridge they have far more general information the french mind too has a tendency to analysis and philosophy and the language has an epigrammatic turn favouring essentially the vivacity of general conversation as we have before said men are fond of the society of well-bred intellectual women the proof of this may be seen in the deserted cafes which from the dinner hour to midnight are left to foreigners provincials and waiters and in the impossibility of establishing in paris clubs such as are so numerous in london a club in the french acceptation signifies a political meeting or when by the anglo mains taken in its english meaning these clubs have degenerated into decent gambling-houses frenchmen cannot understand the enjoyment of doing nothing but lolling about looking at a parcel of men in all kinds of sans souci attitudes or dozing over an old newspaper they prefer general society society where each holds a place and it is perhaps because in these assemblies every one has a part to play and is of some importance that they are so liked by all so frequented and so inherent to the french character the art of conversation is therefore in france the most esteemed wit information learning vivacity knowledge and sentiment infused into one local current and clothed in correct and elegant language is considered as the greatest accomplishment that can be possessed a salon where the most brilliant conversationists are known to assemble will be sure to attract in paris in preference even to the most splendid fete this thorough appreciation of individual qualifications and talents it will be seen considerably decreases the power and importance of wealth this it was that made the gilded saloons of the chaussee d'antin so dull and obliged them to seek to penetrate the charm which nightly filled many little cramped apartments with all that was distinguished and brilliant a few years ago there were several saloons of this description the furniture of which would have been disdained by the fine soubrette of the parvenu but where nightly met the ancienne noblesse the noblesse of the empire all the distinguished statesmen foreign ministers authors editors and artists 
together with women of the highest standing both for position fashion and reputation to be an habitual frequenter of these reunions was like receiving a diploma of distinction and talent and though all were desirous of penetrating within the magic circle many kept timidly back knowing that there the false coin would not pass current and that the genuine coin emanating from the brain would have to pass through an areopagus of critics and could alone recommend them such was the salon of the duchesse de r she was an old woman who had emigrated and on her return had found all her fortune estates and houses sold by the revolution as bien nationaux a transaction which the restoration found they were obliged to sanction as to alter it would have entailed endless confusion the duchesse therefore reduced to a pension was obliged to live in a small apartment in one of the modern houses of the quartier des tuileries in all about the size of one of her saloons in her former residences on what floor it was can scarcely be told how many stairs there were up to it impossible to ascertain for one lost one's breath before having done counting them but when one got up the very landing was filled with footmen and chasseurs in all the liveries of the best families of france holding the cloaks shawls and paletots of their masters and mistresses the tiny ante-room where they should have been was crowded with men wearing all sorts of stars and orders the tiny salon would have made the fortune of a daguerreotypist who could have taken all the portraits at once for there seated in a small circle in the centre of the room were all the women either of fashion talent or beauty who were objects of curiosity and interest to the whole parisian public the duchesse herself in her heavy grey satin dress her point lace ruffles and cape her silvery hair frizzled and curled round her pale refined face having on her head a lace cap with plain white ribbons sat in an armchair by the fire the place of honour which the etiquette of parisian saloons decrees the mistress of the house should never give up to any guest the motive for this apparently uncivil custom being that the lady of the house should be ever at her post to receive her guests and to do the honours which consists here in the bringing congenial spirits together by a judicious question drawing out the peculiar talent of some one individual or by some new idea reanimating the conversation when it appears to flag the chairs and sofas drawn out from the wall allowed of the gentlemen circulating freely behind the ladies and leaning over the backs of the chairs to converse with those they knew though in the immediate circle of the duchesse conversation was general every one put in his word and no introductions were necessary to join in it leaning against the chimney were the men most distinguished for their conversational powers such as balzac thiers Jeannet, m de custine m de montalembert berrier victor hugo and many whose names have attained no other celebrity than that they received from their ancestors but who were mostly men if not brilliant distinguished for their good breeding and a dignity of manner which has died out with their ancien regime in the duchesse's bedroom adjoining the salon assembled all the politicians and foreign ministers a pony who has so long represented austria and france as almost to have become a parisian lord granville whom in spite of his perfect knowledge of french it was impossible not to recognize as the british representative m leron the belgian minister whose great distinction was in being the husband of the beautiful madame leron now seated by the duchesse in the adjoining room many of the ministers and members of the chambre financiers the most distinguished members of the bar magistrates historians all the more serious luminaries of the great social system were here to be found guizot minet thierry a frenchman who has written english history sismondi the historian of republics michelet who has brought to light the poetry of history here was seguier the hereditary president of the supreme court in paris whom napoleon when he set things in order after the revolution nominated in compliance with his hereditary right seguier was then very young and when after his nomination the emperor saw him he was startled at his appearance are you not very young for a president said he how old are you exactly the age replied seguier of your imperial majesty when you won the battle of marengo napoleon never doubted seguier's capacity after this at the duchesse de r blanc's there were no refreshments of any kind if any of the guests were thirsty they asked the duchesse's maid she had no man-servant for a glass of water many of the visitors remained but a short time proceeding from thence to other parties for it became the fashion for all who were fortunate enough to have the entree 
to go to the duchesse's reception if only for a few minutes if it were only to catch up as they sparkled around some of the bon mots opinions and repartees of the chosen there assembled the duchesse never went out herself these receptions were the only amusement her only communication with the outer world she had come back to her native land a lonely woman a childless widow but she loved to see youth around her she loved to hear familiar names echo in her ear the pleasures of the world had lost their attractions but the mind with its ever varying powers could charm her still paris contained numerous salons like this the salon of madame recamier the friend of madame de stal who endowed with angelic beauty had passed through the difficult period of the consulat aux empires without scandal even breathing on her name her manners were so modest and reserved she was so silent that whilst people admired her beauty they doubted the powers of her mind the vicinity too of madame de stol whose constant companion she was may have thrown her into the shade for madame de stol's brilliancy was overpowering in the decline of life madame recamier withdrew to the abbaye aux bois a convent in which there are apartments for ladies who seek quiet and retirement there are few convents which still retain this custom so prevalent in the two preceding centuries and it must also be said that the number of women who grow tired of the world has also considerably lessened madame recamier however though still attractive preferred a dignified retreat from the world rather than to wait for its abandonment she attracted around her the very elite of parisian society the constant visitor and faithful friend of madame recamier was monsieur de chateaubriand his memoirs d'outre-tombe were read here chapter by chapter as they were written the tone of madame recamier's salon was graver than the usual reunion of paris and had a religious tendency suitable to a convent the celebrated preachers of the day abbe ravignon lacordaire eloquent as an apostle with the earnestness of a martyr and an ascetic imprinted on the pale sharp features and on the broad high forehead which from thought watching and fasting had acquired the yellow tint and the polish of ivory the abbe coeur the most ungraceful and inelegant of speakers but the most logical and profound theologian then m de genoux the founder of an establishment for the reform of the repentant magdalens of paris lamartine too would bring his poems here the tender verses of Jocelyn were read in this calm and most fitting atmosphere the ladies of the faubourg saint-germain the mortemar the montmorency the de la tour all who preserved their allegiance to church and state here met as on hallowed ground here occasionally bishops missionaries and dignitaries of the catholic church would mingle in this circle where all was eminently orthodox and high-principled contrary to the established order of the present day when the clergymen never mingle in society madame recamier's salon ignored all the progressiveness of the age and would perhaps have been the vivacious salons accused of ennui but it was very exclusive and therefore much sought after art has always been patronized by the catholic church and thought compatible even with its most austere tenets therefore when the fame of any great artist resounded through paris as to re-echo in the great halls of the abbaye aux bois madame recamier would express a desire to hear and see them and her friends who frequented the gay as well as the grave world would hasten to gratify her wishes here gioletta grisi has sung to the applause of archbishops rubini and lablache have come prouder to sing to this audience than to the one which welcomed them every day here the young tragic muse spite of her jewish origin and her avowed devotion to the religion of her fathers was presented in the early days of her fame here she recited giving lessons in eloquence to the most eloquent the passionate verses of corneille and the majestic poetry of racine none of the wits of the day or feuilletonists or innovators found entrance here indeed it is to be doubted whether madame recamier and her noble friends knew of the existence of many of those who were stars of the first magnitude in other circles madame emile girardin the daughter of an authoress madame gay the wife of a literary man celebrated in many ways and herself an authoress of great talent also held a salon at once literary artistic and political madame girardin is a brilliant conversationist as well as a brilliant writer both of feuilletons novels and dramas she is besides an amiable woman and a woman of elegant and refined manners in this respect the blue stockingism of paris outshines all others 
a literary réunion in france does not present an assemblage of dishevelled ringlets faded ribbons and draggled draperies women here spite of their genius condescend to dress like other people with elegance and taste and though they have genius strive to look as pretty as they can look there by the crimson curtain which forms so good a background for a picture there seated in an antique louis the thirteenth chair is a lady whose unpretending dress has not yet attracted you yet now you have observed her see how gracefully the folds of black velvet fall around her what ease and grace in the attitude the arms folded and the head raised towards a gentleman who is leaning over her chair and earnestly conversing with her how well the black lace and those scarlet ribbons harmonize with the lustrous black hair and the pale complexion are the features handsome who can tell the mouth with its vigorous and well-defined outline first attracts but now you have caught the glance of those deep lustrous sad mysterious eyes you will see no more you are fascinated dazzled although those eyes have rested on you but a moment you see them still they have suggested thoughts and feelings in that single moment such as are roused by a strain of solemn music or some low melancholy murmuring burst who is it have you examined the almost romantic beauty of the person who is speaking to her his high forehead his magnificent hair his long soft waving beard his chiselled features and the almost infantine expression of the face no and yet he too is wonderful he too is a genius the poet of music the author of the dessert felicien david who caught the divine inspiration in the sandy plains of egypt where he saw the red sun rise and set transfixing an immortal rhythm the sublimity of the infinite still you gaze on those eyes they haunt you still now they are bent down shaded by their long lashes often they are so shaded as though weary of gazing on the world ah they are raised again and a gentle smile unbends that firm lip a lady greets her a lady of gentle aspect and manners yet with a face in which tenderness and benevolence are blended that is madame raybon the authoress of many beautiful tender imaginative works whose first book val de pierre made her at once a celebrity but you care not you are still watching those wondrous eyes and the grace and dignity of the few gestures which accompany the deep tones of that earnest voice ah genius has then a magnetism she on whom you look she whose passing glance you will never forget is madame georges sand will you come with me now into some of the genial happy and sparkling salons of bohème into the palace of the tragic muse herself where in addition to the prettiest and most talented of all the actresses brohan doche the dame aux camélias desjazettes rose chéri cruvali caroline dupré and twenty more you will find all the literati all the actors bresson ligier frédéric lamaitre lablache etc etc and most of the jeunesse dorée of parisian life but you will not go you are not attuned to brilliancy to-night let us home as we pass along and see the lights gleaming from every window of every étage you may be sure that within each is a little circle of old friends who for years have met at each other's fireside and who if not brilliant or celebrated are cheerful companions and fast friends End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain a little about a few artists we have been many times on the confines of bohème and have always paused at its limits nor must it be supposed from the title of this chapter that we are about to penetrate into its recesses and its mysteries they are not for us charming and fascinating curious and extraordinary as they may be we will not enter the charmed circle we are not of the initiated bohème would scarce unveil its secrets to us we are going to speak of artists it is true yet they belong not to bohème though bohème receives and recognizes them whenever it can get them within its precincts that however is seldom if ever for the artists whom we are going to visit are amongst the aristocracy of talent they have access to every class welcomed in the highest in the noblest but independent and cringing to none 
they have formed a circle and society of their own within their own walls within their own families from which they can rarely be lured paris the test of talents of all nations has become the home of many foreign artists and italy with all its charms has failed to recall many whom paris and london had idolized and enriched not that we mean to insinuate that any rich or prosperous artist ever settled in london do not imagine such a preposterous thing ever happened there is no artistic society in london merely patronizing and lionizing there is no bohème in london all that is not virtue is vice dishevelled glaring grovelling vice without hope without shame so that the artistic world when it has made its guineas has nothing better to do than to hurry over the channel to regain its dignity its pleasures and its power so many italian artists have become parisians and their houses neutral ground between society proper and bohème are amongst the most interesting salons into which you can get admitted of these artistic homes the most brilliant and most agreeable is that of the great singer la Blache his wife who was as handsome as himself does the honours of his home with grace and dignity though with perfect simplicity seeing rather to the material comforts of her guests than aiming at providing for the entertainment this however in the laissez aller of artistic society is not heeded in either master or mistress for each provides his own entertainment and chooses his own associates la blache quaint full of the wit of a frenchman and the grotesque humour of an italian is the life and soul of his circle in that circle there are numerous children of his own all of whom have married artists or are artists themselves full of animation full of talent brought up with profound admiration for the world of art having no higher ambition than to be one of its distinguished disciples la blache's eldest daughter is the wife of sigismund thalberg a gentle delicate woman created to be the idol and consolation of poor wearied genius if ever genius meets success and stems the torrent of opposition or is not broken against the rocks of the world it is that it finds its guardian angel to hold it up through all love too has a genius of its own not every heart is endowed with it yet no holier mission can woman find on earth than to minister to one of earth's chosen spirits and great is her reward to be the first to hear the strains which shall entrance the world to gaze as first the pencil traces them on images which shall become immortal to listen to the melodies of poesy as beneath the poet's inspirations first they fall into rhythms that future ages shall repeat is this not high destiny enough with cautious ever watchful care to turn aside the petty shafts of mediocrity the wearying cares of sordid life poor genius never yet could brook to soothe the melancholy which comes over genius in its happiest hours when like the murmur of some distant sea the memory of a brighter sphere re-echoes in the heart this this is tender woman's happiest lot and for it the world owes to her its deepest gratitude for tis her fostering care that gives to it the full powers of genius that sends forth untrammelled by meaner cares the poet the philosopher the painter all whose names are engraven on the annals of the world thalberg's wife has been all this to him and he has lavished on her all his love and all his wealth when first they were united a cruel malady had paralyzed the bride and she could not leave her sofa except in her husband's arms many were the scoffs and sneers at this strange love but the artist heeded neither madame thalberg said he need never walk her husband can always provide her with a carriage le blache is proverbially kind to young artists and poor artists they may be found here joining in the merriment and cordiality of the meeting forgetting for a few hours their own struggles and their poverty and as they look around them at the luxury earned by their benefactor in artists like themselves they are led to hope that at some future day they too may have a luxurious home and happy faces round them la blache is renowned for his suppers he has a great appreciation of the material as well of the artistic good things of life all the provision merchants of the palais royal know the glorious basso and smile as they see his portly figure coming along the galleries looking with the eye of a connoisseur on the fish flesh fowl and fruit displayed to tempt the palate and despoil the purse another family of italian artists settled and domiciled in france is that of a contemporary of Lablache, tamburini he too has a numerous family and a wife who left the stage as soon as her husband's fame began to dawn 
i do not sing well enough for the wife of tamburini said she modestly and so she contented herself with home and her children they have now a beautiful house and are amongst the class of artists we are describing artists who have preserved the dignity and respectability of private life and who have not availed themselves of genius to throw aside the world's laws and principles tamburini is less witty less joyous than la blache whose neapolitan nature ever spite of age comes to the surface still he loves to bring around him all his former comrades all the artists who are now treading in his footsteps and without jealousy or envy to listen to their triumphs tamburini had a beautiful daughter who very nearly escaped being a great lady and immigrating from this artist world where the children of one are the children of all like their joys and their sorrows which all share alike beautiful was she as a young psyche brought up with an exemplary mother's care simple unaffected and untrammelled by the conventionalities of parisian life utterly devoid of boldness unconscious of her charms singing like a young bird this fair creature fascinated and allured all soon her hand was sought and tamburini saw his daughter's brow about to wear a ducal coronet he sighed as he told his wife the brilliant destiny that opened for their child the mother wept she felt she should lose her daughter still it was not just to throw so high so bright a fate away putting her arm around her and looking earnestly into those large serene eyes she asked her daughter if she would be a duchess if she would like to live at court in a fine hotel in the dark gloomy faubourg and to leave them all a shade gathered over that sweet placid face and the big tears dimmed the fawn-like eyes not one temptation was there in title wealth or station oh mother said she blushing i am an artist's daughter let me be an artist's wife the happiest fate i would not change it for a crown replied the mother still the noble suitor would take no denial and persisted in his suit and the world wondered at the fortune of tamburini's daughter some months later she was married but she did not become a duchess an artist's daughter she became an artist's wife and now as her mother gloried in tamburini's triumphs the daughter listens with delight to the applause which in paris london and st petersburg has nightly greeted gardoni one of the great tenors of the day thus live the artists in a world of their own sometimes the children are away then how eagerly will tidings of them be waited for by all how will their career be watched by all how will their return be greeted by all welcomed in one house as warmly as in the other so that they scarcely know which is their home all the great musicians and great composers are in this society many of the great patrons of music and a few of its great patronesses many foreigners of the highest rank russians who have known these great artists in the muscovite paris spaniards germans english for your artist is cosmopolitan love to do homage as they pass through paris to the celebrated artists in their homes liszt has his home in paris rossini lived there for many many years david too is here poor donizetti died there bellini is buried within its walls meyerbeer the colossus of music whose muse is inspired but every five years does not disdain the artistic capital of europe dupre the artist whom the french public rejected and who crossing the alps was received with enthusiasm by the italians after which the parisians deign to recognize his genius has also a salon of which his young daughter caroline is the star giving by her high-bred manners and her reserved and irreproachable conduct a higher and perhaps rather a more formal tone to this than any other of the artistic reunions roger the tenor who has recently quitted the grand opera has a beautiful hotel furnished with most exquisite taste his receptions are on sundays the artist's leisure day here all the great and successful artists meet together and as their fancy inspires them sit down to the piano and sing as an artist will sing to an audience of artists with taste and expression such as an ordinary public never inspire cruvelli bosio grisi parodi may be grouped together boccardi a tenor unknown as yet to these regions verdi frasoloni borghimamo alboni alari the composer of the trenozze roger is a man of great refinement and celebrated for his appreciation of every art as well as music he is generous and thoughtless and but that he makes more money than it is almost possible to spend he might find it difficult to indulge in his munificence 
hearing of the privations endured by the troops in the crimea it occurred to roger who was singing at hamburg to contribute towards their relief he sent neither clothing nor blankets nor provisions but fifteen hundred francs to buy cigars for the suffering troops probably the want of cigars was the only privation from which roger had ever suffered for endowed with a handsome person a charming voice and a good musical education success attended him from the first cavatina or rather song he ever sang he made his first appearance at the opera comique and has sang equally well and with equal success in italian french and german berlioz too the musical critic the composer of mystic music the inventor of what he calls tragedies without words has a reception day at which besides musicians the elite of journalism meet hector berlioz married many years ago an english or at least what the french called an english woman though the english called her what she was an irish woman miss smithson she was an actress whose beauty had created for her a temporary success in london but whose irish accent grated harshly on the saxon ear so that finding the atmosphere of london ungenial she had the happy thought of trying a parisian public who so far from understanding irish did not even understand english they however understood the fine face and beautiful attitudes of the beautiful actress and with ducis translations in hand by which they must have been doubly mystified the classical and learned public of paris flocked nightly to see if not to hear shakespeare pronouncing la belle smithson the finest actress of the stage but the public will after a time get tired even of what they do not understand and finding they made no progress in english literature the théâtre anglais gradually lost its vogue then miss smithson married hector berlioz and at the last she found her real vocation for she proved a true and faithful wife embellishing the circle in which her husband's genius placed her forgetting that she had ever been a celebrity her place is vacant now a year ago she was carried to pere lachaise and there is a desolate and neglected air in the salon she used to animate all miss her genial smile her hearty welcome for her foreign alliance and their adoption of another country had not made her forget the country of her birth or its distinguishing virtue hospitality scribe too has a day for seeing his friends but then scribe is so rich what with the millions he has gained and the millions he has married that his though an artistic salon attracts many graver and more important guests politicians magistrates savants and financiers of course for financiers love the vicinity of riches though they may never come within their grasp here might be seen ponsard he who revived and not for rachel the classical tragedy of racine beginning with a chef-d'oeuvre lucrece then his rival in talent though his friend in affection emile augier the author of gabriel mérimée saintine the author of picciola horace vernet ingres alivi the composer of the juive aubert the author of Massianello, flandrin a painter of the pure italian school biard the most expressive of artists whether in a witty sketch for a cabinet picture or in the gravest scenes of history fould the banker minister and now imperial director of the grand opera baroche the eloquent orator whose fine head with its short thick sunny curls clustering around it arrest the attention even before the sonorous voice has time to reach the ear in these reunions of scribe there are few of the other sex his wife who was not of this circle has no artistic aspirations and as we have said these salons are not bohème and therefore none of bohème's fairest ornaments are admitted here madame scribe's kindness indulgence and toleration for artistic caprices and eccentricities which she neither criticizes nor understands does not extend to sanctioning the erratic romantic and picturesque behaviour of women of genius whether actresses or artists some of her old friends may gather round her forming a small quiet circle knitting and embroidery in hand at a large round table near the fire but they are women of her own age never accused of genius or young demure girls who dare not either become geniuses themselves or admire genius in others until after they are married you do not imagine that alexandre dumas has no trysting place other than the bureau of the mousquetaire the wittiest journal in the world he whose hospitality is so great that to paraphrase a saying of the emperor caligula whom he took for the hero of a not very successful tragedy he would wish that he could concentrate the whole human race so that he might entertain them all at one time 
alexandre dumas then has a home in which to see his friends not now the far-famed magnificence of monte cristo which is said to have surpassed even the fabulous splendor of the monte cristo of his imagination that is abandoned dumas having forgotten the one trite command contained in mrs glass's direction of how to cook a hare first catch your hare says the good lady dumas forgot that to be monte cristo it was necessary to first catch your island with the secret treasure and so some importunate creditors took the liberty of bringing this necessity to his mind still he has a home and of course it is open to every one who asks his hospitality his entertainments and his society vary like his genius and his works now under the superintendence of his daughter propriety prevails and dumas himself becomes quite pastoral there is not a word said that might not be put down in a moral tale at other times the daughter having retired dumas assembles a literary coterie and the conversation if not strictly moral is vastly instructive the language if not positively classical is without doubt witty and sparkling the supper and the wines worthy of the conversation and the guests no ladies ever trespass on these strictly artistic reunions though there are other entertainments we told you dumas hospitalities were various in which ladies play a conspicuous part we have heard it said that suppers have been given in which the lovely guests dancers by profession it must be confessed and spaniards by birth it cannot be denied were known to have danced on the table skilfully avoiding all plates and glasses greatly to the admiration of the journalists critics authors and young secretaries of various embassies who assisted at these feats but then these doings resemble those of bohème and with these we have nothing to do and less to say therefore we will not pursue this sketch which rightly to speak had no place here for if ever this table dance was danced brussels was the scene of the exploit and not paris another salon it shall be our last is one which like that of dumas has various phases though it is the salon of a woman but that woman is rachel and like dumas she has different aspects to her character her genius assumes different forms when first the young melpomene emerged from the shades of a small theatre on to the most trying stage in the world that of the théâtre français she was though familiar by instinct with genius and knowing by instinct all that is grand in poetry and art totally unacquainted with the world this utter ignorance of society its forms and its usages added to her extreme youth led her to be silent and reserved so that the various lion hunters who eagerly sought her out bestowed on her the name of the savage hermione none were prepared to find under the tragic toga the heart and taste of an aspasia her wit her tastes her talents her love of luxury and her passions for some years the high-minded girl for such she was had the most enviable position of any woman in europe her success fabulous as it appeared even to herself had made her neither arrogant nor conceited reverenced by her own family whose benefactor she was admired and courted by all she maintained a simple quiet dignity which impressed every one with respect her appearance in public places created quite a sensation she was in the habit of frequenting the chamber of deputies in order to study the various inflections of the human voice but the speakers on these occasions were sure of a very inattentive audience or the interest even of the greatest politicians gave way before their curiosity to gaze on and to admire the classical pure-minded and dignified young tragic muse but a year or two wrought a change the soaring genius who besides being a woman of genius was a woman endowed with common sense had been studying the world and comprehended all in which she was wanting endowed with all that cannot be learned she knew nothing that can be taught there is an autograph letter extant addressed to desjazette thanking her for the great kindness and generosity with which she helped her through the first struggles with poverty which though charmingly expressed is very badly spelled her language too when not that of the poets was not always either elegant or correct but in two years all these defects had been corrected rachel no longer reserved or timid was found to be not only a genius but a woman full of intellect elegance and wit her repartees were quoted her grace which Janet had called angular grace her elegance and ease of manner lauded to the skies the countess du chatel who had taken a mother's interest in her making her pass whole weeks in her house 
contributed to the high tone of her manners rachel at this phase of her existence could command any of the most exclusive salons to open its doors to her the duchess of berwick the countess Doriani, the noailles montemarts all the embassies felt honoured by her presence and would put on their invitations to meet mademoiselle rachel as they do when guests are invited to meet a prince of the royal blood rachel was a pious follower of her religion and though that religion was one abhorred by catholicism for rachel is a jewess her very piety became a merit in the eyes of fashion generous too she was and is distress of whatever creed or under whatever form or in whatever language it may appeal to her never appealed in vain she was the rara avis words could not be found to speak her praises her conduct was irreproachable not one scandal had been breathed either in the theatre or out of it at this crisis she went to london and there sharing the common enthusiasm queen victoria generally a pattern of reserved propriety testified her admiration bestowing on her a magnificent bracelet and by an inscription placing the royalty of talent by the royalty of descent victoria to rachel said the bracelet and rachel felt that her reign had begun she returned to paris she was rich she had but to speak and greater riches came she changed the marble statue became a woman her taste for luxury knew no bounds no eastern palace surpassed the home she created for herself her caprices her follies her extravagances were the wonder of the day her early friends remonstrated but they were unheeded soon came such reports of the wild wanderings of the muse that friends in a fright withdrew no scandalous passion no intrigue was imputed but it was said that she who knew so well how to express the passions of greek and roman heroines had also revived the orgies and the vices of old greece and rome still her genius increased from year to year the public favour too for the public knew nothing of what her friends deplored rachel now was a potentate herself she wanted no patronizing and she with her ardent passions and energetic will resolved to enjoy life in her own way perhaps there is no truth in all that has been said perhaps from her very friends may have come these rumours for virtue is not indulgent or charitable and admits but one way of being virtuous its own and so may indulgent and prudery have turned away be it as it may rachel has around her all the remarkable men of the day she has young sisters with her she is protected by her brothers she will no longer condescend to be patronized and therefore goes no more into the salons of the great there are few women in her circle she cares not for their society but she is the very semiramis of the artistic world and her hotel sometimes the very areopagus of intellect is considered the imperial palace of bohème end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the burial places of three dynasties we have talked a great deal about les invalides we have gazed from afar at its gilded dome some of its inmates we have met in our peregrinations but we have never been to this great institution of a great king let us go now louis the fourteenth founded les invalides this home for the old soldiers who had fought for the quarrels of kings for interests and insults of which they knew nothing without either honour glory fortune or renown it is but just that with their blood they should have earned a home for their age and infirmities louis the fourteenth le grand monarque founded les invalides and yet it is not louis the fourteenth and his plumed court that come before you as you pass beneath these grand majestic arches the thoughts wander not so far but the spirit which hovers over you is that whose memory though he himself is mouldering in the grave has more power over the hearts and imagination of his own and all other people than any hero of antiquity or any conqueror or potentate of modern times napoleon in the grand simplicity of his nature rises before you and each veteran soldier as he passes recalls to you some of those wondrous battles which in recital have so entranced your youth he too lies here brought by the justice which time brings to all though some like him await it in their graves dying as he did in exile and in bitterness but he has returned one nation had mourned him all nations welcome him 
and now he reposes in the midst of his people where still his laws govern his dynasty rules where his image still stands by every fireside and where his spirit ever hovered many terrible events had shaken the very hearthstones of france dynasties had changed once more had the old bourbon kings sought the hospitality of the stuart palace two fatal names beneath a fatal roof blood had flowed again through the streets of paris the cannon had boomed through its churches and its palaces the very religion of rome had been despoiled of its power in france but still the heart of the people had not beat with one mighty throb as now it beats when the voice went forth proclaiming he is returned to-morrow he will be here it was the very depth of winter the snow had fallen and the long icicles hung weepingly from the trees the dull heavens lowered in grey masses o'er the city men shuddered as hastily closely wrapped in cloaks they sped along the streets women kept by their bright firesides shivering as they drew the soft silk and cashmere round their tender forms little children clung closely to each other in their cradle beds and the poor crouching beneath the porch of the churches prayed till oblivion sent them dreams of warm and genial skies yet throughout all the day of the fourteenth of december eighteen forty groups assembled in all parts of the city not noisy nor joyous nor animated as are the people on a holiday but hushed and calm speaking in low tremulous voices then he who had seen the hero living whom dead they were awaiting with such beating hearts became himself a hero and they gathered round him and looking on him with veneration would inquire how looked he then what said he when he placed the cross upon your breast did he not love the poor soldier and honour him like any prince or general tell us of him and of his deeds all the usual pursuits and avocations of the world were suspended and thrown aside in every house young and old rich and poor forgot their griefs their joys their interests in expectation of this resurrection of the past from sundown or rather from twilight for no sun had risen on this day the circulation of all carriages and horses was forbidden in the streets yet all night long might be heard the tramp of many many feet the multitude of the villages around coming from afar to meet with solemn welcome their long lamented friend and sovereign at length the dawn broke and the dull light fell on the silent yet crowded streets all hastening to one point occasionally an aide-de-camp would ride rapidly through the streets taking to the palace tidings of the progress of the funereal procession then all would lapse into silence a strange mysterious silence the silence of the multitude down to the champs elysees came the human stream there stationed in double row stood the army and the national guard behind them were the crowd a crowd in which all ranks were mingled or rather in which for this day at least they were forgotten from tree to tree flowed silken draperies of imperial purple banners floated from the ice-covered branches here gigantic statues reared their white forms bearing palms and laurel crowns there on high columns burned the flaming incense the centre the wide road alone was solitary not one dared to infringe on its limits or cross its path along here he was to come on his way to the invalides where dwelt his children and where henceforth he was to dwell for ever now a distant shout is borne on the sharp chilly wind nearer yet nearer still he comes there aloft above all on a car like a temple of victory there covered by a purple crape dotted with his golden bees there lies the dust of him you love of him whom tears now welcome and one deep and universal cry of vive l'empereur on he came the cannon of the invalides boomed at regular intervals and the bells of every church from the great bells of notre dame to those of the tiniest village greeted him as he came the troops presented arms and then again the people's mighty voice now gathered into one cried out vive l'empereur solemn though heartfelt was their tone it was the hero they welcomed and memorials of his victories were around them to his glory they did homage yet could they not forget the martyrdom and exile which for years had bound him to a burning rock by the funeral car sadly yet proudly walked the veterans of his army surviving thus to witness this last and greatest triumph of their chief hubert 
the faithful hubert who for nineteen years had untiring sentinel of the dead kept watch by the solitary tomb now heard the triumphant march of the pale sad spirit he alone had not deserted here too was the young prince of the new dynasty which filled the emperor's throne and the sailors who had brought his ashes over the wide seas to the haven where they were to rest but nor prince nor mariners had an interest for the people now they were with the past and with the dead and thought not on the present or the living on he came and now he reaches the triumphal arch under which as yet none have passed the arc de l'étoile as the car glides under its gateway the grey dull clouds vanish from the sky out bursts the brilliant sun tinging with bright glow the imperial purple turning the sad icicles into sprays of glittering diamonds illuminating with genial warmth the thousands and thousands of faces turned eagerly towards its rays then from a thousand voices arose the cry le soleil d'austerlitz the sun which had helped to win the victory of austerlitz now burst through its winter bonds to welcome him and now he has passed beneath the gates and the dead chief for an instant is once more in the midst of his soldiers his generals and his staff whose names though they like him are ashes stand indelibly inscribed on these stone walls on still on and he has passed the other gate he is in paris in his own capital which he had meant to make the capital of the civilized world he is here at last and now he is born to the home for which his spirit craved the dome of the invalides where many who have waited for him are crumbling into dust around him and where those who survive to see him take possession of his tomb are weeping for sorrow and for joy the sovereign of the present descends from his throne too and receives the sovereign not of the past or present but of all time whose spirit has ever reigned and reigns in france to strains of heavenly music hollowed by the prayers of the church by the pomps of royalty and by the tears of many they laid his ashes where they will rest for ever in the midst of his warriors and his people here beneath the dome he lies in that quiet solemn tomb so simple yet so grand so full of majesty so full of repose yet even as you look inspiring thoughts of heroic deeds and sad thoughts of fallen fortunes and inexorable fate come o'er you elevating the soul from this silent tomb to other realms to have beheld the last scene of the most wondrous history the world ever saw is like having evoked the past generation from its grave or like some brilliant realization of a dream like the egyptians of old who buried their dead under their hearth stones and lived with the urns of those they loved and venerated around them the french people feel that they have now their father's ashes within the sanctuary of their homes from all parts of this vast city either in the bright sunlight or by the pale moonbeams is that glittering dome of the invalides to be seen and the children of paris as they suffer watch and toil gaze on it and think he feels for all now that he is there in their midst not long after this ceremony which filled the imagination yet surpassed all it could conceive there came another ceremony and another funeral the sun shone brightly and the green trees waved the fountains played gaily in the light and the roses bloomed in all their glory and he who was about to be hidden forever from this busy world was in the heyday of youth prosperous happy beloved and deserving of that love yet though all felt pity for his fate though all felt compassion for his weeping mother and his sisters for his manly brothers standing round his coffin for his aged father bowed beneath his grief still the world and the world's avocations went on their usual busy round pleasure itself scarce paused in its career when ferdinand of orleans the kind and noble prince was taken from his palace from his young children from his loving wife to be buried by his gentle sister marie still that small chapel erected at neuilly by a mother's love over the spot where he fell and died in its cold grey simplicity speaks of a deep and inconsolable grief all the elements of interest nay of romance are here in this sad catastrophe the pallid corpse of the noble form which but an hour before had sprung with so light a step and so light a laugh into that carriage from which death hurled him forth the old man a stricken father following weeping tottering leaning on the trembling arm of the mother whose trust in heaven made her endure this blow this last scene where the heir to a throne 
so long and deeply played for was taken from evil to come yet somehow the bourbons particularly the younger branch are wanting in one element so eminently french in the dramatic and their joys their sorrows even their deaths fail to impress the multitude the french people listen coldly to the appeals made to them by sense propriety and logic elena the young widow of this very prince bearing like maria teresa her children in her arms fails when she appeals in the chamber though she shows the young heirs of him they loved and respected to rouse in the french bosom one spark of that enthusiasm which at the words of the austrian empress made every hungarian sword leap from its scabbard vainly too did the daughter of maria teresa the unhappy but heroic maria toinette strive to inspire her husband and her sovereign with one spark of kingly dignity which should repel in awe the crowd the son of st louis was born to be a martyr not a hero and in his death only was he worthy of his ancestor who conquered in palestine and died in suffering and misery in the moslem land he too louis the sixteenth rests in another funeral pile of this capital where death and victory have alike their monuments he louis the sixteenth and the beautiful marie antoinette of austria or all that could be found of them a few whitened bones rest in the chapelle expiatoire of the rue d'anjou a chapel raised to their memory by the elder bourbons during their brief sojourn in the land of their forefathers so within the walls of paris rest the representatives of three dynasties which ruled its people since the republic recalled the sovereign power napoleon the bourbons of both branches they who were kings by divine right and he who was chosen by the people passed away from the memory of this generation is a solitary scion of the elder race the lineal descendant of the dead sovereigns who rest here now in silence and neglect unthought of and untended is the pale cold grey chapel erected in the memory of the bourbon whose father fled like a culprit from his throne whose young heirs now are exiles and outlaws from their native land napoleon alone lives in the hearts and memories of his people on every tower his banner waves on the throne he raised from the dust where the feet of the indignant multitude had spurned it sits one in whose veins flows his blood not only his but the blood of his loved josephine the guiding star of his fate a star which while it ruled led but to glory and success perhaps that solitary star had gleamed in pale and loving watchfulness on the distant tomb to which the waves murmured eternal requiems perhaps its holy and benign rays have followed the beloved dust to the gorgeous tomb where now it rests who shall say but entwined for ever are the two names of josephine and napoleon while the daughter of the caesars maria luisa the mother of the heir so long desired he whose life scarce marked its passage on the earth rests in coldness and contempt in a land where his name is forbidden well might the young chief engrave on his first simple gift to josephine his new-made bride a mon étoile she was his star his destiny his fortune for the star that guides that rules that leads even genius to high destinies the star that inspires courage that restrains and hallows his holy tender unchanging and devoted love such as she felt for him end of chapter twenty eight and the end of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite recorded by celine major